Um, so as, as Martin said, um, I'm, I'm Callum McGregor. I'm a researcher at the University of Hull working in the Energy and Environment Institute there where we, we tackle all sorts of uh, questions around things like uh, sustainable energy and, and dealing with, um, with flooding and, and various other things. Um, uh, and my own research at the moment focuses on on brownfield sites and the wildlife that occupies brownfield sites. I, I also um, volunteer on, on the committee of, of Butterfly Conservation Yorkshire branch. That's this logo here. Um, and we do we do various things um, to promote butterflies and moths, not just not just butterflies, but moths as well um, in and around Yorkshire and, and work towards uh, their conservation. Um, so you might be wondering why somebody who's interested in, in wildlife and interested in butterflies and moths in particular might be talking about, um, uh, about dark skies as part of a dark skies festival. And, and, and um, this photo gives you a clue. This is a photo from my, from my PhD field work um, in which I'm um, out in the field uh, counting moths flying around a street light. Um, so my, the topic of my PhD research was the effect of street lights on moths in, in essence and, and so this is something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and researching um, and I hope that I can can share some of what I've learned with you um, this evening. So why are dark skies such an issue? Um, this figure is, is from a paper that was published in 2016 and it shows the extent of light pollution across the globe. Um, you don't need to worry too much about the color scale of the figure. All you really need to know is that any area on this map that has been colorized is an area at which the, the uh, level of, of night sky brightness at the darkest point of the darkest night is brighter than the level of night sky brightness associated with a full moon. So any area of this map that's been colorized never experiences a level of darkness that you would associate with natural nighttime. Zooming in on Europe, you can see that we've got it pretty bad, really. Um, and in fact, in order to see what, what, what a nighttime really looks like in Europe, you would have to travel to, to Iceland or to Scandinavia or to the, to the very tip of, of, of uh, Scotland. And that's not to say that, that um, you know, I don't want to, to um, to, to do down the, the, the new dark sky parks here in Yorkshire. The quality of the dark skies there is, is probably better than we've got anywhere else in England pretty much. Um, but it's not a natural situation nonetheless. And of course, dark skies are, 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 um, are generally thought of as a problem for astronomers. And, and you can certainly see why in this image, this was a, a photo that, that was taken on, uh, on the island of Menorca in the Mediterranean Sea. And you can see this absolutely amazing image of the Milky Way. But the closer you get to the town on the right hand side of the image, which is the port of Mahon, the less you can see the stars. And, and really, you lose them entirely in the, in, the, in the glare that comes off the town. But it's also a problem for a lot of other things. It's also a problem for wildlife. And the reason for that is that um, our, our, our natural systems, our natural ecosystems, and all of the species that live within them have evolved over the course of millions of years to follow a natural rhythm of day and night as the Earth spins. And they use this rhythm. They use this rhythm in order to time their, their daily, uh, uh, daily physiological rhythms and also in seasonal parts of the world, they use it to time their yearly physiological rhythms. And this, this image on the right actually shows the human circadian rhythm and how as, a, as the day progresses, progresses into evening and into night and then back into daytime, um, various physiological processes uh, take place that are triggered by those changes in lighting conditions. Um, it's really important to us as humans, but it's important to, to almost any organism you care to name um, whether they're whether they're day active, diurnal, or or nocturnal, night active, um, equally so. And so, as ecologists, we're really interested in the potential effects of artificial light, which um, which, which essentially mask these rhythms and break up these rhythms of day and night. Now, of course, we've known for um, centuries that that one organism in particular is. Um, is particularly strongly associated with, with um, impacts of artificial light. And we've known that since long before the, um, the invention of electricity, the invention of electric light. So Shakespeare wrote in The Merchant of Venice 
about about candles singeing moths. So Shakespeare, even in the days when when it was just candlelight and and, and lamplight, he knew that moths were attracted to artificial lights. Um, and of course, since electric light came along, um, images like this one on the right have become really commonplace and really familiar, where you get uh, swarms of swarms of uh, of night flying insects, not just moths, but of course moths are the, are the best known example. Um, attracted to lights and flying around lights. Now moths, um, before I go any further, I imagine that quite a lot of people on the call, when, um, when they hear the word moth, the first thing they think of is something a little like this, um, threadbare carpets and holes in their, fav in their favorite jumper. Um, so I want to take this opportunity to, to bust a bit of a myth. Um, we have in, in the UK, we have around two and a half thousand species of moths that, that, that visit these shores or, or live here. Um, and of those two and a half thousand, there are basically two species that are in any way serious pests of, um, of natural fibers, of, of, of wool fabrics and so forth. So um, rounding, rounding to the nearest 10, that still leaves two and a half thousand species that, that, that aren't pests of, of our clothes and carpets that we can get excited about. And there are really good reasons to get excited about them. So um, at the very most basic level, moths are really quite stunning when you stop and look at them. Um, some of them are a little bit dull and brown, which is, a, which is the stereotype of moths. I'll admit that. Some of them are a little bit dull and brown, but some of them are really amazing. This uh, on screen is my favorite species of moth. It's called the burnished brass, and it really is that color. It looks like someone's taken a, a fairly ordinary moth and painted some gold leaf on it um, to make it look a bit prettier, but it really does look like that, and there's no gold leaf involved. Um, and this is another moth. This is one that I saw on a trip to the States a couple of years ago that, that just absolutely blew my mind with the amazing um, bright orange color and, and black and white patterning on it. Um, yeah, well, once you start looking at moths, you'll, f you'll find very quickly that some of them, like, like these two, are just absolutely stunning. But being stunning alone is not enough for some people. Some people want to know, well, what's the value of these organisms? Um, and in, in the case of moths, they are also very valuable. So one of the ways that they're valuable is as um, a really key component of food webs uh, in our natural ecosystems. Um, moth caterpillars in particular are an absolutely crucial food source for a really wide range of, of, of our um, native breeding bird species. And, and this photo shows um, a, a blue tit, which most of you will hopefully be familiar with because it's a really common garden bird. Um, and that thing that it's got in its beak is the caterpillar of a winter moth. Um, and winter moths are enormously abundant in the British countryside. They particularly like oak um, as, as a food source. And blue tits and various other species um, eat absolutely vast quantities of, of winter moth caterpillars um, during the spring and, and feed them to their chicks. Um, so they're really crucial in, in the food chain. Um, and we've known that for some time, but what we're beginning to understand more and more is that they're also potentially quite important as pollinators. And most people, I think when, when, you, when you say uh, pollinator to them, they in instantly think of bees and perhaps particularly of honeybees. Um, but more and more, we're starting to recognize that, that it's not just honeybees, that lots of other bee species, uh, wild bee species, including bumblebees and solitary bees, are also important as pollinators, and various other groups are important as pollinators. Um, and now we're increasingly understanding that moths are important as pollinators as well. Um, and that was a really key focus of my uh, PhD studies. So uh, when I started my PhD um, back in 2013, I think this statement at the, at the top of the screen, which, which was from a, a paper that had recently been published at that time, um, uh, pretty nicely summarizes the, the, the state of the science when, when thinking about pollination, that the main groups of pollinators were bees, butterflies, flies, um, and, and, and in tropical systems, a, a couple of groups of vertebrates as well, although not so much in, uh, in the UK. Um, and I, th I think, uh, I hope that if, uh, if this sentence was to be rewritten in 2021, um, probably it would need a little bit of a change. And that change would be to substitute the word butterflies for the word lepidoptera, which of course includes both butterflies and moths. So the first thing that I did in my PhD was, was I, I decided to, um, to, to settle down and read as much of the, of the scientific literature as I could and try and find as many examples as existed 
of, um, of moths being involved in pollination. And that was to try and understand just how, um, how, how broadly important moths are as pollinators and how much evidence there was to support that. Because at that time, as I say, the, the, the general feeling was that they weren't very important, but we had a suspicion that they were. Um, so I set about that, and in the end, I only found 168 studies, which actually, uh, in the context of, of the scientific literature, is, is really not very many. Um, but what was striking about it was the breadth of those studies. So we found studies from um, most of the major ecosystem types in both temperate and tropical systems. So that's, uh, that's uh, seasonal systems like, like in, the, in, the, um, in, in Europe and also tropical systems, which, which tend to be less seasonal. Um, uh, for, for, for example, in, in Central America and, and Africa and, and Southern Asia. Um, and also examples from, uh, from all of the continents except Antarctica, and, and there really aren't very many pollinators in Antarctica, so um, it's not a surprise that there weren't any examples from there. And lastly, a, a really, really wide range of plants, um, including lots and lots of different species and, and a really wide range of plant families. So this, this um, uh, initially seemed to back up our, our sort of suspicion that potentially moths might be more important than we had suspected as pollinators. So the next thing we did was we went into the field um, and we went out onto, we arranged to do some field work on a, on a farm near Beverly, um, which is a town just outside Hull, just north of Hull in the UK, um, not very far from the North York Moors National Park, but, uh, but, uh, but um, uh, actually nearer to the Yorkshire Wolds than to the Moors. Um, and we, we employed some, some new uh, techniques that had been recently developed to, to use uh, the DNA inside things in order to identify them. Um, and we used those to, to uh, collect pollen uh, that was being carried on the mouth parts of, of moths that we caught on this farm um, and try and identify what that pollen was. Um, and the first finding that, that, that we had was that really quite a, quite a high number of moths was carrying pollen. Um, about a third of individuals and, and two fifths of of species were carrying pollen, which was uh, more than we had been um, told to expect by certain, certain pollination biologists. Um, a lot less than if you did this kind of study on bees. With bees, you would expect 100% of individuals to be carrying pollen. Um, but, but for moths, that was, that was really quite a high number. Uh, it was considered to be quite a high number at the time. Um, and again, what was really striking from this was that that, that pollen that we were sampling from moths contained um, a really huge range of plant species, considering it, it was just on a, on a farm in, in fairly, um, fairly average farmland, let's say, um, for, for lowland Britain um, in East Yorkshire. And what was really, really remarkable about this was that that pollen included a number of species that in some circumstances are crops. So we found uh, brassica, species in there which we weren't able to identify to, to all the way to species level but that group of species includes oilseed rape which of course is a, is a really major crop especially in East Yorkshire. Um, it included elderflower which of course is much more likely to be a wild plant um, when, uh, when we detect it in East Yorkshire but of course elderflower is quite an economically important crop in some places um, and it included peas which in this case uh, in this circumstance we're, we're probably from the allotments on the edge of Beverly rather than from uh, any farmland. But again, peas are in some places, particularly, you know, even in our region, are a really important crop. Um, and this was, uh, as, far as, as far as we are aware, this was the first evidence that moths could be providing pollination services to, to enhance crop yields in farmland in the UK. And that's really quite an important finding because that makes moths economically valuable. So if we understand moths to be important and we understand them to be uh, economically valuable, it then should become a concern to know that they're in decline. Um, this document on, on screen now, The State of Britain's Larger Moths, was published uh, about eight years ago, and I believe that, that an update to it is due to be published in 2021 quite soon. Um, in the 2013 version, was included this graph. And, and what this graph shows uh, in, in its most simplest um, interpretation is that on average um, species of moths have been in, in a fairly steady and, and, uh, and fairly severe state of decline over a sustained period of, of 40 years. 
Um, and I, I, I strongly suspect that when the update is published later this year, uh, that line won't have, won't have changed. It will still be going downwards. The reasons for that decline are likely to be multiple. There are lots of things involved, climate change, habitat fragmentation, pesticide use, all sorts of things are, are, are playing a role in this. But what was not really understood back in 2013 was whether light pollution was involved, whether artificial light at night was influencing this decline. And we, we had good reason to suspect it might be, but we weren't sure. Um, I think, again, I think that is something that, that since 2013 has changed. And the paper that really changed it for me, uh, in my mind, the scientific paper, is this one, which was published by uh, Frank van Langeveld and colleagues um, from, from the Netherlands. And what they did was they, they took uh, long-term data on, on all of the uh, species of moth that occur in the Netherlands, um, and, they, and they split those species up according to how often they, um, uh, how strongly they, they were attracted to, to sources of artificial light, which, which basically you can, you can get an estimate of from the ways in which species are recorded. So one of the ways in which you can record moth species is by using what's called a light trap where you put out a, a bright light at night and because moths are attracted to bright lights, they fly into this light and, and you can trap them using uh, any of a variety of, um, of ingenious ways to, to catch moths and then count them and, and release them again um, once you've identified them. So moths that are, that are mainly attracted, uh, mainly, mainly recorded at light traps like these, um, you can be pretty sure that they're, that they're attracted to light reasonably strongly. So, so these moths were, were categorized as attracted to light. And what Frank, Frank and his colleagues found is that this group of moths were on average in really quite severe decline over a long period of time. By comparison, there are some moths that we know are quite abundant in the countryside because we're able to record them by other methods. Um, like, for example, you can, you can do something called wine roping where you, well, it, 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 it's, it's what it sounds like. You dip a length of rope in, 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 a, in a solution that contains quite a lot of wine and then moths uh, can smell that wine and, and, and think that it smells rather delicious and, and they fly in and, and sit on the rope and you can count them sitting on the rope. Um, and there are some moths that we know are really abundant in the countryside because you can record them very readily by using techniques like wine roping, but they never ever turn up in a light trap. So these moths that uh, Frank and his colleagues categorized as being not attracted to light. And what was really interesting is that that particular group of moths on average didn't show any trend in population, neither an increase nor a decline. So this really strongly suggests that, um, that the attraction to light in itself is a contributing factor in whether moths are declining or not declining. And interestingly, the same result um, pops up when you compare moths that, that only fly in the day, that, that where um, attraction to light really isn't a factor because, because they're not flying at night, um, versus moths that, that fly uh, only at night or moths that fly in both day and night. And it's only the moths that fly at night, either exclusively or, or at night and day, which uh, Frank and his colleagues found to be declining. So this was really the smoking gun for, for, um, for us to understand that, that, uh, that, that artificial light must be important in driving declines in moths. Before I go on, I always get asked this question when I, when I give this talk. Um, and usually people say, oh, it, it must be a silly question, but, but, but why are moths attracted to light anyway? It's not a silly question. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the answer is we really don't know. Um, there, are, there are several theories. Um, each of those theories has its merits and each of those theories has its um, issues and none of them has yet been proven. What we do know and what is useful in, in understanding um, the, the relationship between moths and light and how we can potentially mitigate it is that moths aren't attracted to all lights the same. So they're particularly strongly attracted. This, this graph here um, shows, shows the, the relative strength of attraction to lights of different colors. And you can see the colors along this kind of rainbow bar on the, uh, the x-axis. Um, and what, what, what uh, this graph shows is that moths are particularly strongly attracted to light that is 
uh, blue light through into, into violet and actually beyond what is visible to us into ultraviolet. So moths can perceive uh, more light in the ultraviolet spectrum than, than, than our eyes can, and they're really strongly attracted to that light. When you get up to sort of yellow light, they, they will respond to yellow light, but they're not that attracted to it. And actually there's almost no attraction at all to red light, and, and I, I would question whether they can even see it. So knowing that, there are a number of reasons why um, artificial light at night is particularly um, damaging, we think, to moth populations. And the first is that it has a really strong influence on their relationship with predators. One way that it does this is that predators are, I think, wise to the fact that moths and other insects are attracted to light. And some groups of predators uh, have been have been documented actively hunting around um, around sources of artificial light at night in order to to uh, maximize their chances of catching moths and other insects. Um, and this uh, rather enterprising spider is is a really uh, nice example of that. It's uh, built its web in the middle of a in the middle of a lamp and and uh, by the looks of the photo has caught uh, far more insects than it could possibly eat. So that's true for, for sit and wait predators like spiders and geckos and things like that. But it's also true for active hunters of moths. And uh, the, perhaps the most famous active hunter of moths uh, is, is the bat. Um, and we know that a number of species of bats, um, such as pipistrels, for example, which are one of the most common um, groups of bats, um, will, will uh, uh, actively choose to hunt around uh, artificial lights at night in order to uh, maximize their chances of catching a moth. And in fact, this is even more serious than it sounds. And, and um, this has been shown by some really fascinating research that, that, that's been carried out in the last decade or so. So uh, moths, many, many species of moths um, have evolved ears that are capable of hearing the echolocation calls of bats. And if you want to know more about the echolocation calls of bats, I'd really recommend uh, last night's talk in the Dark Skies Festival, which had some, some great information about that. Um, but moths are able to hear these calls. So, so what happens usually is that a bat flies in and it makes its echolocation calls and the moths hear those and they, and they react to them. They plummet out of the skies and they seek cover so that the bat that they've just heard um, can't catch them. Um, and that's a really, uh, it's a really sophisticated defense. Uh, uh, and what it means is that uh, moths and bats are engaged in this, in this constant struggle where it's actually quite difficult for a bat to catch a moth. Um, so moths have a pretty good chance of, of evading uh, their predators. What's been shown recently is that when you add a street light into this equation, your bat flies in and it makes its echolocation call. But many of the moths that hear this call don't respond in the way that they should. And they just keep on flying around as though they didn't hear the bat. And that makes them really vulnerable to being, to being uh, predated upon by the bats. Now, um, again, this is something which we don't quite fully understand yet, but, but um, perhaps the most persuasive um, theory to, to explain it relates to, um, relates to the, the nature of the bat's echolocation calls themselves and, and what those uh, calls could indicate if you're a moth flying around. Um, so bat echolocation calls are, um, are something called ultrasound, which is, which is um, essentially too high pitched for our human ears to hear. Um, but, but I think the comparison was made in last night's talk to, to a pneumatic drill. Um, so it's, it's like having a pneumatic drill uh, pulsing out sound um, at, at very high pitches. Now, if you hear a sound like that at night, the chances are the thing that's making it is a bat. So, you, so if you're a moth and you hear a sound like that at night, it's, it's a pretty good bet that you're going to be doing the right thing if you respond to it and get out of the sky as quickly as you can. If you hear a sound like that during the day, the chances are the thing that's making it is actually a grasshopper or a cricket, or in fact, in the last hundred years or so, a pneumatic drill. Um, so if, if you're a moth and you're flying around during the day and you hear an, a, a, an ultrasound noise, and every time you hear one, you react by, by doing this panic maneuver to get out of the sky. Um, you're not gonna get very much done, particularly if it's a really sunny summer's day because you're gonna be hearing them all the time and almost all of them aren't going to be bats. So the theory to explain this, this um, failure to react to, to bat calls 
under, under sources of artificial light at night is that the moths are effectively tricked into thinking it's daytime. So they see this, that there's, there's a lot of light around, they see that there's bright light, they hear the ultrasound call and they go, ah, it's probably a grasshopper. Um, and, and, and by that, by that mechanism, um, they, they become much more vulnerable to, to predation by bats. Now we also know besides predation that the reproduction of moths is, is really um, heavily affected by artificial light at night. Um, this is an image of, of, of uh, the male winter moth, which I mentioned earlier, winter moths as being a really important food source for, for all sorts of birds. Um, the male is a fairly typical looking um, moth in, in terms of what people's stereotypical image of, of moths is. It's, it's fairly dull and brown. This bizarre looking creature is the female winter moth and she has no wings. Um, she, she's one of a, a number of species of moths that have evolved for the females to lose their wings. Um, and what female winter moths do uh, is they, 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 uh, they emerge as adults and then they find uh, a nice tree, usually an oak tree if they can find one, and they crawl up the trunk of that oak tree and they start to pump out something called, uh, called pheromones. And pheromones are, are sort of nature's perfume. They're a, they're a scent that, that drifts out on the air that, that um, other organisms can, can detect and respond to. And when a male winter moth detects the pheromones of a female winter moth, when he smells her perfume, he knows that he can fly into her and potentially mate with her. Um, that's, uh, that's how it should work. That's how, that's how it works uh, in natural circumstances. And again, what we know is that when a street light is introduced into this equation, things change. The first thing that changes is that bizarrely, not all of the females even find their way up a tree trunk in the first place. Um, so, so rather fewer females um, appear on the tree trunks and start pumping out these pheromones. Um, those females that do appear on the tree trunks, uh, they don't produce as much pheromone. So they, they pump out less pheromones, they, they essentially put on a bit less perfume um, when, when there's an artificial light around. And thirdly, the males that, that are flying around um, when there's an artificial light around, they become less good at, at, at responding to those pheromones. So fewer of the females that are sitting up on the, on the tree trunks producing pheromones will attract in a male successfully. So you end up with this kind of uh, triple whammy, if you like, whereby, um, whereby there's three separate effects um, on, the, on the reproduction of these, of, uh, of these um, moths that, that, that come from having a street light in the equation. Now, even for those moths which, uh, which, which do manage to, to, to uh, find a mate uh, when there's an artificial light around, the trouble isn't over. And this is more research by, by uh, that same group in the Netherlands where, where Frank van Langveld works. And this is research that was led by Kurt van Geffen. Um, and what Kurt showed is that when you, when you rear moth caterpillars, in this case, moth caterpillars of the, of the cabbage moth species, um, under, under different colors of artificial light, those moth caterpillars actually don't ever get as big. They grow more slowly when you rear them under artificial light, which, which in this graph is the green and the white um, uh, points than under, um, under no artificial light in dark, in dark conditions or under red light. Um, and you might think, well, does that really matter? Does, um, does, does caterpillar mass make a great difference to, to a moth and, and actually it does because it, it really strongly relates to the ability in females to, to their ability to produce eggs. Um, so larger uh, moths that, that become larger when they're caterpillars, once they turn into adults they can generally produce more eggs and that's quite a good indicator for their ability to, to reproduce. Um, and lastly we know of course that, that, uh, that artificial light affects um, moth behavior as well. Um, obviously it affects their behavior in the sense that they are attracted to lights and they'll fly to them, but it also affects their behavior in other ways. And this is a, yet another study from Frank van Langeveld and that, and that uh, extraordinarily productive Dutch group. Um, and what they did was they, they, um, they brought some moths into, into the lab and, and, and put them in flight cages where they could fly around in the lab and, and behave semi-normally. Um, and they gave them access to, um, to artificial flowers with, with, uh, with a sort of sugar solution replicating nectar in them. And those moths were uh, are generally quite happy to, to drink from that kind of setup. Um, and then they exposed those moths to a range of different um, 
uh, conditions of artificial lighting, as well as to unlit controls where, where it was dark. And they observed whether the moths were, were, um, were happy to feed from these artificial flowers in these different conditions. And what they found very simply was that moths were much, much less likely to feed from these artificial flowers um, when they were exposed to, to lighting than when they were in the dark condition. Now that to me is somebody interested in the relationship between, between moths and flowers um, in the sense of moths being pollinators was really, really interesting because what that suggests is that artificial light might actually fundamentally change the relationship between moths and flowers, even if the, even if the abundance of moths wasn't changing. And of course, we know that the abundance of moths is changing, it's going down. But if, uh, if there's further impacts on top of that, on, the, on, the, um, on pollination by moths, uh, above and beyond the impacts of, of just reducing their abundance, then that could be really um, quite significant. So we decided to set up some studies to look at this. And the first thing we did very simply was, uh, was we went into the field um, in, in Oxfordshire in this case, and we found 20, um, 20 sites where we had uh, a street light uh, on, a, on a road verge, which kind of overhung a hedge. Um, and on the other side of the hedge was an agricultural field. And the fields generally looked something like this. So this is the hedge and there was a street light on the other side of it. And then there was a little bit of a field margin. Sometimes there was more than this, sometimes there was less, uh, and then a crop. Um, and for each of those sites uh, with a street light, we, we set up a, a matched pair site, which was usually a, a stretch of the same field margin further along, which was at least 100 meters away from any street lights. So this was um, our unlit control. This was a site which was in as many ways as possible, the same as the lit site, but had one key difference, which was the lack of a street light. Um, and in each of these field margins, the, uh, both lit and unlit, um, we recorded moths and we recorded them using, using three methods. The first was a, a, a pollard walk transect, which is just where you walk along um, and catch moths, uh, uh, following a sort of standard procedure and, and walking at a fixed pace and so forth to make sure you're doing it in as, as reproducible a way as possible. Um, the second was using light traps, which I mentioned earlier, um, in, order to, in order to catch moths uh, more passively. Um, and then the third was, was overhead flight activity surveys. And we did this because uh, the, the pollard walk transects where we catch moths are great for catching moths flying around at ground level, um, but I'm only six foot tall. And so even with a, a net on a long handle like I had here, I could only catch moths up to about two meters high. Um, of course, street lights are at least four meters high um, in the UK and often much higher than that. So we were interested in what was happening to moth activity um, at, at higher, higher levels than, than where I was able to catch them as well, and whether something different might be happening there to what was happening down at ground level. And then for each of those moths that we caught, we brought them back into the lab and we sampled um, pollen from them, uh, from, from their mouth parts. So uh, I've just got a couple of examples here where you can see a, a pollen grain on the proboscis of this uh, common pug at the top. And a couple of pollen grains on the on the palps of this burnished brass at the bottom. So we were able to to to, to collect that pollen up and um, and uh, put it under a microscope, and in most cases get a pretty good idea of what plant it came from. And what we found was really striking. So first, considering the graph at the bottom, this is the graph from the uh, the pollard walk transects. Um, and it's split up into three seasons because uh, for, for um, essentially for analytical reasons, but, but you don't really need to worry too much about that. Um, what we found was that the, the abundance of moths at the unlit sites in each pair, and those are the gray bars, was much higher, about twice as high as the abundance of moths at the lit sites in each pair, the white bars. Um, consistently across, across the, 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 the second two seasons. And the first season we had rather less data for, which is more likely, which is most likely the explanation for a lack of an effect there. Um, so, so yeah, we were catching fewer moths at ground level when there was a street light involved uh, in a nutshell. Up at street light level in our overhead flight activity surveys, the picture reversed. So we were observing flying around at the level of the street light twice as many moths um, at the lit sites than at the unlit sites. And what this suggests to us is that moths 
at the lit sites are being sort of sucked up out of the field margin to fly around at the level of the street light, um, you know, buzzing around the street street light rather than doing what they should be doing, which is foraging in the field margin looking for, for nectar and for host plants. But it also suggests that moths uh, from the unlit regions, which remember were only sort of 100 to 300 meters away, are not really being attracted into these lit regions in great numbers because they're still um, more abundant down at ground level there than they are at the lit sites. And the pollen data was also interesting, although it was, it was less clear cut, but we found um, a range of, of pointers within that data to suggest that, that less pollen was being carried by those moths that we caught at the lit sites. And that was both uh, in the sense that, that fewer moths were carrying pollen in the first place, and, the, and that the, the total sort of um, assemblage of pollen, the number of plant species that were being found in that mixture of pollen on moths was fewer uh, when those moths were caught at the lit sites. So fewer moths were carrying pollen and fewer plants were having their pollen carried um, when there was a street light in the equation. So this was evidence of reduced pollen transport. Pollen transport meaning um, pollen being moved around by moths in the landscape. And we wanted to know whether that translated into reduced pollination. Um, of course, uh, for, for pollination to occur, pollen needs to be deposited on, on a flower as well as picked up from one. Um, and we weren't the only people wondering this. So at the same time as we were asking this question, uh, a group in Switzerland led by uh, Eva Knopp um, went out into the field and, and set up um, an experiment using uh, the cabbage thistle, Circium oleraceum. Um, and they were just comparing between lit and unlit sites. And what they found was that uh, when they had light pollution, which in this case is, is the white bars, um, their, their cabbage thistle plants were, were less likely to be pollinated than when they didn't have light pollution, which is the sort of bluish gray, gray bars. And that's really striking because it's not a plant that we really consider to be pollinated by moths at all. Um, cabbage thistle is supposed to be bee pollinated. Moths aren't really supposed to play a role at all, um, or so we thought. But in fact, moths play such a significant role that when you put an artificial light above this plant, it, it's, it's um, substantially less successful. Um, so at the same time, as I said, as Eva Knopp and, and colleagues were doing this study, we set up a very similar study um, using a, a different plant species, uh, the white campion, Silene latifolia. Um, but we were not just interested in the direct comparison between lit and unlit. We also wanted to know whether there are ways in which we can reduce the impacts of light pollution. And there were two things that we were particularly interested in investigating. The first of those um, comes about because of, because of uh, it, or is particularly interesting because of this petition on screen. Um, for those of you who know how government petitions work, this number here, 11,637, will be interesting because it's more than 10,000. And when you submit a, a government petition and you get more than 10,000 signatures, the government is obliged to respond. And what the government said in response to this uh, particular um, petition really stuck out to me because it, it, it rather suggests that the government don't quite know um, what the problem is with light pollution or didn't at this time. So they said the Department for Transport encourages all local authorities to replace their street lighting with LED lighting where it's economically feasible to do so. Now that's really interesting because LED lighting to, to ecologists and also to astronomers is often thought of as being worse from the point of view of light pollution. So we wanted to know how does LED lighting compare to the current technology, which is high pressure sodium, um, when it comes to, to moth uh, pollination and any potential impact on that. Um, and we didn't really know what to expect because the, at that time there had been a couple of studies of this and they showed totally opposite things. So on the left you have a study from Germany um, and they found that the LED lights, which are the two sets of bars to the far right, uh, attracted the fewest moths out of, out of any set of light that they tried, which included high pressure sodium and also included some types of metal halide light. Um, and on the right, you have a study from New Zealand, which found totally the opposite, that, uh, that high pressure sodium lights um, attracted fewer moths than LED lights. The other thing we were interested in, the other potential mitigation strategy, 
is part night lighting, which I'm sure all of you will be familiar with the concept. It's, it's when you, you have street lights on during the early part of the, light, the, the night, but around midnight or 1am they get turned off. And part night lighting is, is really particularly interesting to, to us as, an, as ecologists because of, um, because of this study, uh, which had been published a year or two previously um, on bats. Um, and what this study suggested was that part night lighting effectively allows there to be some kind of night time in which, uh, in, which uh, in this case, the bats behave as if it is night time, um, even if it is slightly reduced. So this, uh, these lines show activity of bats at, at three different sets of sites. Um, the black line is, is unlit sites where there's no street lighting. The, the gray solid line is uh, lit sites where there's full night street lighting. And the dotted line is, is sites where there is part night street lighting. Um, and this, is, this was pipistrelles, which is a species of bat that responds positive to, positively to light, that chooses to hunt around lights because they'll uh, catch more moths there. So you can see that, that at the lit sites, the activity of pipistrelles is far higher than it is at unlit sites, and that lasts for pretty much the whole night, that effect. Um, the dotted line showing part night light sites is the really interesting one because initially in the early part of the night, it accelerates with the lit sites. So activity is, is higher at the part night light sites than the unlit sites, just as it is at the lit sites. But as those lights start to turn off in this, uh, in this band here, um, through their part night lighting schemes, activity drops off again. And by the, by the um, time that all of those lights are off, that line is pretty much tracking the unlit sites. So this really suggests that part night lighting, in terms of ecological effects at least, could be quite um, quite a neat little way to, to tackle um, to tackle light pollution. So we were interested in looking at that as well. So we went back into our, our same farm in Beverly in East Yorkshire, and uh, the farmer very kindly let us uh, set up some mock street lights in their field margins. And, and these are a couple of them. So on the left, you have the high pressure sodium light, and on the right, you have the LED light. Um, and I'll, I'll just highlight this because I mentioned the colors of lights that moths re respond to earlier. These are the, the colors of light that, that are output by these two different bulbs. And you can actually see it in the pictures if you look at them. The LED looks particularly white because it emits color across pretty much the full spectrum. But it has a really strong spike of light around, around the blue wavelengths, um, around 450 nanometers. The high pressure sodium, by contrast, um, primarily emits light that is yellow around 600 nanometers. Um, each of these lights we also set up in two different configurations. So we had full night lighting and part night lighting options and the part night lighting options, we turned the lights off at midnight. Um, and we had unlit options as well. Now, what was really surprising about these findings was that uh, our, our study species, our white campion plants, when we put them out under these lights, uh, they were most successful when they were under full night street lighting. They, they got the most pollination uh, when they were under a street light that was on all night. Uh, that was something of a surprise, and it certainly doesn't lead us to the conclusion that we should be uh, lighting up the entire countryside so that absolutely everybody, uh, so absolutely everybody plant, every plant gets uh, maximum pollination. Um, we think we, we, we have uh, working hypotheses that that uh, that white campion maybe wasn't the best choice of plant and, and perhaps uh, certain characteristics of this plant might actually make it more visible when it's under a street light. Um, but one thing that we can interpret is that is that this was a disruption. This was a, a, a significant difference between full night lighting and unlit. So it is a change in the ecosystem. Um, and those kinds of changes we know from a, a lot of other science, a lot of other studies of, of, of ecological systems can, can kind of have unbalancing effects, a bit, like a, a bit like the ripples spreading out from a stone that falls into a pond. So if there's a disruption to, to this species, even if it appears to be positive to this species, it might have negative knock-on effects for other species. Now, bearing that in mind, what was particularly interesting about the results from our part night lighting setups was that they showed no difference at all to our unlit setups. So what disruption there was under full night lighting totally disappeared under part night lighting. Um, and that was, that was, I think, a really striking result. In terms of the comparison between uh, high pressure sodium on the left and LED on the right, we found no difference at all between those two different lamp types. Um, and in both lamp types, we found the same effect um, uh, uh, when comparing between full night lighting and uh, part night lighting in that full night lighting had more pollination under it. 
So what does that lead us to conclude in terms of how can we mitigate light pollution as a society? Part night lighting, it appears, um, well, we, we know for a fact that part night lighting reduces light pollution in terms of astronomical light pollution. Obviously it does because the lights aren't, just aren't on after midnight. Um, and the results of, of our study and of other studies do suggest that it could be quite um, productive in terms of reducing the disruptive effect on nocturnal wildlife. Of course, the great hurdle with part night lighting is acceptance. It is uh, wildly unpopular with the general public. And I do sympathize with that. You know, it, it, if, you, if you happen to be walking home from the pub um, at, at 2 a.m. And, and for whatever reason, you don't feel safe because it's dark and you can't really see your surroundings and there's a street light there, but it's not turned on. I can understand why you'd be annoyed about that. Um, so that's a hurdle that needs to be cleared in terms of uh, getting part night lighting accepted. And, and generally, I think that that, that involves um, not implementing part night lighting in every street light, but only in the street lights where they really don't have any use after midnight. Um, the switch to LED that the government recommended um, certainly doesn't seem to be uh, the best idea from the point of view of reducing light pollution. It probably increases astronomical light pollution. It's unlikely to help wildlife. Our effect didn't find any benefit, but our, uh, our study rather didn't find any benefit, but it didn't find any detriment either. Um, various other studies have found benefits or detriments and, and it's a really a little bit unclear. But the key thing to understand about LED is that it's really potentially a very important technological advance um, if you're not just considering light pollution, if you're considering um, the, 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 the whole uh, um, uh, breadth of, of, of things that impact um, our nocturnal wildlife. And that's because it's more energy efficient. So LED is potentially a really important cog in the, in the, in the fight against climate change. It is, of course, also wildly unpopular with the general public because people perceive these lights, which of course have a lot of blue in their spectrum, as being really cold and, and, uh, and uninviting, I suppose, for want of a better word. There are other options um, that are being developed and tested in a few places, but, but they're much less popular. Um, things like dimming lights and motion sensitive lights. Um, they may have uses in certain settings, but they're, they're not likely to get um, as widely uptaken as, as the main two mitigation strategies. So lastly, I just wanted to, to talk about what you can do, what you and I can do around our own homes to, to, to help with this, um, with this issue. So the first thing to think about is just where you have lights, could you have slightly different lights that, that have a, a, a lower impact? So think about the color of your lights, think about color spectra. Um, in America, they're really, they're really hot on this. They, they, they talk a lot about reducing the blue content of lights um, and using warm white lights. And, and uh, often you can find a color temperature when you're buying a light, um, which, which is given in, in Kelvin. Um, so you're looking for something that has less than 3000 Kelvin on it. Better than that is to not have as many lights, um, less light from fewer lights. So one thing you can consider to do this is if you have external lights on your porch or on your driveway, um, this is a really great setting for motion sensors. So you can only have that light on when it's actually needing to be on. Um, and of course, uh, you know, part night street lighting is potentially a, another way to achieve this. A, a, and um, a, a, and you know, consider perhaps you could consider whether whether you do really object to having it. Um, in your in your area, or, or whether you whether it might be okay. Um, the best thing, of course, is no light at all. Um, and really, from this point of view, I, I, I'm thinking about certain types of outdoor lighting, like uh, some of the lights that people put in their back gardens, for example, that are purely decorative. You know, you, you can certainly you could certainly think about whether you actually need to have those at all. Um, and and uh, and if you if you if you didn't have them. Well, that would be a, a step in the right direction from the point of view of mitigating light pollution. So I hope you found that interesting, that there's a little bit of time left uh, for us to take some questions. Um, and and uh, we don't have to rush off, but, but uh, you know, if you, if you need to leave, leave the Zoom call, then, then uh, we're, not, we're not counting. Um, I'd just like to thank again the North York Moors National Park for, for inviting me to give this presentation and, and Martin and Neil for their, for their help in, in running the call. Um, various people who contributed to the research that, that, that I've presented, to my own research that I've presented in the, in the course of this talk, um, including both uh, co-authors and of course funders, and, and all of you for, for, for coming along and, and watching the presentation. I, I really hope you found it valuable. 
Um, so yeah, uh, thank you very much. And, and just a reminder that the, um, to, to go and, and check out the Yorkshire branch of butterfly conservation in our work. And if you have any questions that the, the chat button is at the bottom of the screen. Thanks, Callum. We don't have any questions in there. We've got one person so far who's asked to uh, about the papers um, that have looked at moths not reacting to bats, bat calls under lights, somebody interested in the references. So. Yeah, um, so uh, it's, it's mainly work that's been done by, um, by Bristol University. I'm just trying to remember the, the names of the, of the scientists. Um, I think that Gareth Jones at Bristol uh, led the research group that did a lot of this. So if, if you Google Gareth Jones um, at Bristol University and, and look at his um, his papers, you should be able to find um, uh, find the information you need there. I've got a question here. Do moths go from plant to plant when they pollinate like bees or do they visit less plants? Yeah, that's a great question. It's not something we know an enormous amount about because it's quite difficult to follow a moth around at night. But certainly um, we, we have good reason to believe that the behaviour of moths um, will be different to the behaviour of bees. And the reason for that is that um, obviously bees are, are what we call central place foragers. So they have a hive, they fly out from the hive, they forage a bit and then they fly back to the hive to take resources back. And they repeat that process over and over again. Moths don't have that, that central place that ties them down. So they're much more likely to kind of bimble through the landscape from flower to flower, um, uh, much more randomly, if you like. Um, but certainly moths do, um, you know, they'll, they'll feed at a flower um, and then they'll move on to another flower. So there is, you know, there's, there's plenty of opportunity for them to carry out pollination, but their behavior is, is not the same as, as, as what you might see a bee doing. Another question from Victoria. Is there any evidence of day flying moths, non light attracted moth and butterfly caterpillars being affected by artificial lights like the light attracted moth caterpillars are? Yeah, fascinating question. Um, it's not something we know a huge amount about yet, but um, colleagues of mine at Newcastle University and, and the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology um, are looking at this as we speak really it's, it's ongoing research to find out there's certainly there's no reason to suppose that the caterpillars of these these species that that you mentioned that that are not um not affected by artificial light at night as adults there's no reason to suppose that their caterpillars um wouldn't be because because they're still going to be exposed to it and it's still going to um, affect the the the, the, the daily rhythms even if it doesn't affect their their nocturnal behavior Question from Mikey. We are in a partly lit town where lights go out at midnight or one o'clock, but this has prompted more people to install insanely bright security lights. Any tips on how to convince the neighbours it's a bad thing? <laughs> yeah, oh, there's, there's, um, that's, a, that's a real shame to hear. Um, I, I suppose, you know, if you can sing the praises of motion sensors to them for their security lights, then, then, then that might help. Um, there is, I, I, I haven't mentioned it in my talk today because I, I didn't really have, um, have time for it in amongst all the other things that I wanted to talk about. But there is some really interesting research on, on how um, that kind of lighting actually affects people's safety, um, both as pedestrians and as drivers. And actually, um, the suggestion is that the, the benefit is not as great as people perceive it to be um, from having light that, that in some circumstances having you know really strong lighting on your driveway might actually for example make you more at risk when you step off your driveway onto onto the street into the, into the zone of darkness immediately surrounding um, that's something i'm not really that qualified to talk about but but i'd encourage you to go away and uh, again do a bit of googling and, and find out about that um, but certainly the, the, the simplest solution would be to persuade your, your neighbours and your townsfolk to, um, to use motion sensors on their, on their insanely bright security lights. Jackie asks, do you think it's worth trialling the different lighting methods with councils, especially if the energy consumption reduced might promote a win-win for council and the environment? 
Yeah, a lot of councils are really keen on part night lighting, actually, on, on introducing it as much as they can. And, and, and I think that if there wasn't such great resistance from the public, then they then then we would have seen it uptaken a lot more because, you know, energy bills are, are quite a big part of, of council spending, I think, in, in terms of maintaining street lighting. Um, so they are very keen on on things that will reduce their costs. Um, and, and, and a lot of them have, have taken up these technologies already. Um, there are certain places where, where, um, where not in the UK, as far as I'm aware, but particularly in the Netherlands, where, where local authorities have been sort of more proactive in terms of trialing new technologies, trialing things like uh, motion sensitive road lighting, for example, or, or uh, street lights that are in, you know, really weird colours, you might think when you first see them. Um, like red and green street lights to see whether these have have positive impacts, but um, I'm not aware of any of that happening in the UK so far. Jackie's added something. Plus, it's it is stationary lighting rather mobile, i.e., busy motorways that are that are the only issue. So, is it stationary lighting rather mobile lighting that is the issue? Yeah, I'd love to be able to answer that. We've, when, um, I say we, the scientific community have done virtually no research at all into the effects um, of, of mobile lighting, of, of car headlights and things like that on, um, on nocturnal wildlife. Um, my, my instinct is that the effects would be less severe because, because um, because generally these lights move through the landscape so quickly that a moth is not going to be within their zone of influence for very long at all. Um, but certainly they're, they're a huge source of, of light pollution within the landscape and, and they must be in some way disruptive to nocturnal wildlife. But it's, it's such a difficult question to, to, to even tackle scientifically that, that no one's, um, nobody's braved it so far. Uh, comment here from Louise that there are trials of red lighting happening at the moment in Britain, which is which she feels is good news. Obviously, taking it away from that blue blue part of the spectrum. So, okay, that that's great to hear. That's not something I was actually aware of. But but if that's the case, then you know that's that's really good in terms of in terms of it being a, a proactive step towards towards reducing light pollution. And certainly, it's you know it's the case that um, that that. Uh, the technology exists to produce LED streetlights in, in almost any colour you would care to, to have them. Um, so it's just a matter of, of identifying the best colour, if you like, and then and then persuading persuading councils and so forth to, to, to use that colour rather than um, rather than the existing commercially available lights, which are mainly uh, uh, for LEDs are mainly blue. Okay, there are no more questions at this moment, Callum. Oh, one more. Hang okay, on. should we should we draw? Oh, oh. We draw <laughs> make this the last question. One, one more quick one. Yeah. Make this the last question. Do you think that there will be noticeably negative effects on crops pollination cited near music festivals, for example? And if so, should music festival lighting be targeted more in terms of its ecological benefit? I know there are current studies on bats and festivals. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I suspect that for things like crops, um, it, it, it wouldn't be too much of a worry. And the reason I say that is, is because things like musical festivals are quite brief, they're quite transient. So the, 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 um, for, for something like, like the pollination of a crop, um, the effect of having lights there for, you know, say three or four days, you know, the length of a, the length of a Glastonbury or something like that, is, is going to be quite negligible because, because those effects are going to be cancelled out over the course of the flowering period, which might extend before that and might extend after that as well. Um, for, for something like, like, uh, like a plant pollination, the effects are only really going to be, be significant if the source, of, the source of light pollution is there for the full flowering period, which, which might be you know two or three weeks or even longer than that. Um, and, and if that was the case, then, then that might be more of a concern. Final comment from Kat, plus three months to set up and pack down. 
uh, still deserve yeah that's true I, I hadn't really considered that night. but I, I suppose a lot of the stage lighting and, and things like that wouldn't wouldn't yeah. be active the whole time but but yeah in terms of the broader effects then that's that's a good point yeah okay I think we'll call it a day and thank Callum uh, for a very interesting talk and uh, you'll be able to find if you want to view it again or you know people who'd be interested in uh, hearing it then uh, it'll be posted on the uh, Yorkshire Butterfly Conservation website uh, in the near future. Thank you, Callum. Brilliant. Thanks, Martin, and, and thanks everyone for coming. It's been uh, it's been uh, great to great to talk to you all, and I, I hope you found it useful. <laughs>